the IRRs right now, they're not complementary to what you feel you've got. Is that because, again, coming back to, we need to be thinking, as investors, we need to be thinking this is a long-term play? Well, basically, when you look at large projects of this sort of scale, to get a project like this up to, a, say, a 20% IRR, which uh, we show um, in the deck uh, at, a, at, I believe it was $1,400 gold price, roughly. The, uh, it, you know, there's very few large scale projects like this that, that end up with those kind of RRR, IRRs. So we feel pretty good and, and obviously we're trying to de-risk it and improve the economics with the work that we're doing with a target to move up towards, uh, you know, that 20% IRR range um, with the discount rates as we showed them in, in the PEA. Right, so I guess I'm, tr I'm trying to get the balance between getting in early with some potential upside as you build out the resource, because you're talking, it's a very large district-wide uh, body you're, you're, you're working with here. Um, it's, this is not a small company or a small asset, because there, there are more attractive grades out there. They're more attractive, immediate, you know, seemingly immediate returns with lower costs associated with them. I mean, how are you selling this to people? I mean, when you're, when you're talking to investors, what, what are you saying to them? Well, I mean, it's still a growth story as we speak right now, like I mentioned earlier with the exploration works on. And, you know, like I say, Ecuador is evolving and it's becoming a, a premier mining destination. And, the sovereign risk related with Ecuador has gone down substantially. I mean, we've seen in the time that we've been in the country, um, the, the royalty rate, um, the windfall tax disappear, the royalty rate reduce, the tax re fiscal tax regime reduce, so that you've attracted majors, like I mentioned earlier, BHP, Anglo, uh, First Quantum, Newcrest. So, so basically, it's one of the last, um, uh, systematically unexplored um, jurisdictions in Latin America and probably the world. So, so basically, the upside for investment investors are participating in the early stage of the project. The project has enough legs that will likely be built as a mine uh, in the future. And uh, we're doing all the work we can to identify the scale of it, which is, is looks like it's growing at this point, de-risking it, putting in place the permitting, and, you know, if you compare it to a lot of the, you know, if I, let me just scroll through the deck here for a second. This is kind of important to, um, to go to uh, page 14. Basically what we did here is we looked at uh, gold producing projects that had the potential of over 250,000 ounces a year. And on this slide, what you'll see is um, projects in blue and then projects in yellow. So basically, Congrejos is the fifth largest glo global development project controlled by an independent developer. And all the blue ones are majors and mid-tiers. And if you look at how it stacks up, you know, the project um, is, is significant. I mean, we have about 373 thousand ounces of gold production a year. What are the assumptions that that's based on? Well, that's based on the PEA study and that, that's the economics that we did in the PEA study. So basically, if you go to, um, let me scroll around a little bit more here, the slide on number 11, let me just walk through the PEA metrics real quick and, and you get a feel for it. So on the bottom left on, on page 11, you know, we're looking at initial production of 40,000 tons per annum. Um, the initial capital cost there is 831 million US. And then in year uh, five, we would finish an expansion to 80,000 tons per day. That's another 406 million of initial capital. And then the life of mine 16 years. So there's another 271 million of uh, sustaining capital. And then if you go up to the production scenario, the first five years you get 270,000 um, ounces of gold a year and 25 million pounds of copper. And then at the expansion, starting in year six through 16, it's 421,000 ounces a year for the overall average of 373. And the other aspect that the project has in its favor is, um, you know, low, uh, operating costs. So if we look at C1 cost, um, we're looking at $523 uh, an ounce. Yeah. And then if you look at ASIC on, on gold, 
we're looking at $569 an ounce. And then because it has copper, if you look at gold, uh, gold equivalent, our cash costs are uh, 706 C1 cost and, and 741 ASIC. So that gets us down to um, you know, the pre-tax IRR of 15% and the MPV at $920 million, and that's at $1,300 goal. Now, one of the interesting aspects of this is we did this on the 5% royalty rate, and the government has just changed the scale on the royalties that you um, negotiate with an investment contract. So if we were to go to um, the 3%, the bottom rate, and they, the government did this uh, acknowledging that some of the projects like Congrejos um, don't have the high, high grades that say a Lundin Gold uh, Fruta del Norte does. Um, so the government, if we could get 3%, that would bring the uh, post-tax MPV up to a billion dollars roughly. So you know, we're, we've had initial conversations with the government and we need to continue to move the project along to get an investment uh, agreement in place. So, you know, there's, there's upside in that context. Right. But I mean, just, just again, for investors new to you, new to this part of the world, explain to them what large scale, low grade mining involves. Yeah, I mean, basically long mine life. And, and I think um, it's an economy of scale type project, right? So for instance, Ecuador has low power costs. It's about six cents per kilowatt hour. Um, it's a diesel producing country in its oil sector, so diesel is relatively inexpensive. Um, the project itself has a low stripping ratio. So when you look at all of these aspects um, from an operating cost, when you look at whether this project will be feasible and, and during production will it throw off, generate good free cash flow, really it comes down to two things. It's not so much the sustaining or the initial capital, it has more to do with the operating costs and the gold price, right? So we can't control the gold price environment, but we can, um, with the scale of this thing, be very effective in, in the operation of it. And so there's quite a few things going for it. That's why you see on page 11 that it's got favorable uh, cash costs, right? And when you benchmark it against a lot of other uh, gold projects um, in the world, and, you know, if we go over to... Um, Slide number 15, for instance, when we start to look at uh, average gold production versus all in sustaining costs, Congrejos, um, it ranks really well compared to its peers, you know, and, and that even includes Fruta del Norte, that's quite a bit higher grade. Uh, we're producing similar amount of gold every year. And then if you look at um, the mine life versus uh, the US dollar capital per ounce of mine, the capital efficiency, as you would say, you know, it's sort of $250 um, uh, an ounce. So that benchmarks well with peers as well. Yeah. So Congrejos, um, compared to other independent developers, is a long life, low cost asset. And, um, you know, if you go back and you look at um, page 14 again, you can see a lot of the um, high capital cost projects or a lot of the blue projects to the left of Congrejos. Um, you know, a lot of those projects are looking at quite a bit higher ca initial capital to operate. Yes, yeah, so, um, again, help us understand this a bit better. So this is all being based off a of PEA, which is a very, well, it includes in the name, preliminary document. Um, sure. But, you know, in terms of the team's experience um, of moving projects from PEA stage, you know, the assumptions you're making, why you're... Tell us yeah. why you're confident of being able to, you know, get through to you know, a point where someone will want to take this off your hands because the, the economics are delivered as you are um, forecasting them here. If you look at um, our history with um, the Lumina Copper story, and that's the best way to compare it. When we, um, the first major project that we advance, and it's a mine today, is the Casarones mine in Chile, and it's, it's a large uh, upper porphyry mine. Listen, we took the same approach. We went in and explored it, tried to fully define it. We went ahead and, and de-risked the project and it was uh, acquired by Pan Pacific. So the key to that was really good solid engineering exploration work so that the project was de-risked. 
And then we moved on. I was the CEO of Northern Prue Copper, and that project was acquired by Chinaman Metals and, and Jingxi Copper. And, and what we did there is we did a PEA, real solid engineering work, um, and we were at the pre-feasibility stage, and it was acquired, um, you know, for $550 million U.S. roughly. Um, then we were involved in the Relincio project, which is a tech project today in Chile. And that project, we had a resource estimate. We were still doing exploration drilling, very similar to where we're at with the Congrejos project. And um, Tech acquired that project, and it's in the development pipeline today. And when Tech acquired it, they did a lot more exploration work, in it, and it's a much larger project. Now, the ultimate one uh, that we sold was Taka Taka, the first quantum. And that project we did a P at the PEA level. Um, we took major risk areas like uh, the pre strip, metallurgy, uh, water, <clears throat> and we advanced that work to a pre-feasibility level, and First Quantum acquired the project, and, and that's next in their queue after Cobra de Panama. So that's gonna move into the development scenario. So I think um, as far as an exit goes, basically um, the level of work that's being done now should give most companies uh, comfort uh, that this project can move forward and, and be economic in the future. And obviously a lot of that depends on the, the gold price, copper price environment. But uh, you know, there's very few projects out there with this sort of scale, particularly ones that are in independent uh, developers' hands. You know? uh, so I think that the potential for a major mid-tier to come in, probably before we even complete the pre-feasibility study exists, and then ultimately, if we have to continue to move towards pre-feasibility study, we're doing all the work right now to continue to advance the project. Okay, so I'm hearing it's a large project. We've seen it before, we've done it before, and we've delivered for investors before. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think just to, to highlight that in the Lumina Copper scenario, um, we raised about 175 million and returned about 1.5 billion to shareholders. And, and I guess maybe the best way to look at that is if you flip over to um, slide number 17, um, you can see the, the tombstones for all the different companies that have been part of the Lumina Group. Yeah. And uh, you know, the senior management team and Ross have been involved in all these companies. And, and you know, that's, been our, that's been our business plan, our model. And we've been very successful at it, and, and very few companies uh, have done that. Right. I guess on, a, on another note, the Anfield Gold uh, asset that's shown there, that was merged with uh, Trek uh, and with um, Newcastle to form Equinox Gold, where Ross is the chairman. So, you know, we have a long history, we have access to capital, we have the ability to execute technically. And we have the wherewithal socially, environmentally to navigate difficult jurisdictions. And Ecuador is evolving in a really positive way. Um, and uh, we feel that we'll be successful in Ecuador as well with Lumina Gold. Yeah, no, we, we, we heard the Equinox story earlier uh, this month. Um, great story there. Uh, do you think that, you know, the Ross Beatty factor always helps? Because you said it just now. You don't. You feel confident about being able to go and raise capital for the next stage. So on the on the money front, you've got 14 million bucks in the in the bank now. You're gonna. What are you gonna deliver in 2019 with your cash? Basically, that cash gets us through through the year. And you know, the bulk of the money is going into the ground in in Ecuador right now, related to the drilling programs, the engineering work, uh, the metallurgical work. Uh, all of that is uh, where the majority of that money is going. We run pretty thin corporate overhead. Um, so most of the money is in the ground and it's going towards de-risking and further understanding the, the extent of the uh, project, particularly understanding the new Grand Bestia area, which could be a, a project changer from the PEA. Right, okay. Um, and are you raising any more capital this year or are you good? We, we don't anticipate it at this point now. Basically, if you look at the history of the Lumina Group, um, we've just got uh, six holes into Grand Bestia. Newmont drilled five holes. We just finished a hole that was some 800 meters uh, deep, and uh, we hit mineralization through it. And we're in the process of um, 
really getting into the Grand Bestia area. Now, if we continue to have good success there, we may bring more drill rigs in. And that's the history. Like if you look at the Taka Taka project, we started with one drill rig and ultimately ended up with 10 drill rigs. So that's the only thing, continued success there that could change um, the spend uh, for the year. And if that happened, we would uh, evaluate where we sat cash wise and determine if we need to go back to the market. Marshall, our investors want to know how you're going to make the money. How, do you, how can you answer that question? Yeah, I think basically one of the main ways to uh, look at that is we still haven't dis discovered the full scale of this project. And, and I think what I want to do is direct you over to uh, slide number 10 in the deck. And I think this really um, shows you the upside here, which isn't realized in the market at this point. And basically, if you look at the right side of slide number 10, that is uh, the Congreos deposit. And basically what you see on this slide is um, the pinkish color is all of the gold equivalent grades between 0.35 and 0.85. That's all above the cutoff grade that would go into the mine plan in the PEA. And then the, the hot red color there is over 0.8 grams per ton gold equivalent. And what you can see in this slide is that um, there's a significant deposit in the Congrejos deposit at the right where the majority of those drill holes are. And about a kilometer to the left of that is the Grand Bestia project. And basically what you see there is um, five of the uh, Newmont holes and, and two, of, um, two of our holes. Subsequently, we, we drilled four more holes and this thing's holding together. What we don't know is if these, uh, this is a true satellite deposit, if the two deposits are connected and are one deposit. So if you look at that slide, there's um, this breadth outcrop at the surface which is 4.8 grams per ton gold and uh, 2.3 grams per ton silver and basically there, there's some other in, intercepts around 10 grams and this is all at the surface on the, on the very edge of um, the pit which is that gray outline and listen if these two things are connected and, and we're going to drill in between we're going to fully understand the size of Grand Bestia which looks large at this point if these two things are connected, you've got a really large pit, which would totally change the scale and the economics of the project. Mm -hmm. So as we have it right now in the PEA, um, just the deposit at Congrejos on the right is included in the PEA. Everything to the left um, at Grand Bestia is not. So that's gonna be new resources added. And if the two are connected, it's a substantially larger deposit. So there's upside on the scale of the project, the number of gold ounces. And potentially the grades are, they seem higher at the surface. Why is that? Uh, you know, that, the outcrop at the surface, that could be a little bit of secondary enrichment uh, from the oxide near the surface. Um, but we do have good gold grades. Um, for instance, the best Grand Bestia gold grade was, uh, I believe it was hold number 99, was 208 meters of... Um, of 0.91 grams per ton gold and 1.16 uh, copper right from the surface. So, you know, like I said earlier, we're looking to see if Grand Bestia will be a higher grade near surface starter pit um, or if it'll just add resources to the mine life of the project. So there's some real upside in, in the, the scale of uh, gold ounces that could potentially be discovered here. So that's a big upside for investors.